Now, we are entering into our la second and last week on our Estimates of Generosity series, which I know everyone is sad that after this week I will not be talking about money until next year. Um, so cr try to contain the crying, please, okay? Um, it's distracting. Uh, no, but over the next couple of days, hopefully we all get our cards turned in um, and, and um, we can start to look at what our bu budget is going to look like for 2025. That sounds really weird saying it, doesn't it? 2025 always does that to me. And I'll probably sign 2024 and a thousand things until I finally get it right. And then by then it'll be 2026, right? Um, but uh, um, we uh, are, are wanting to see what our budget looks like. And so we can see what we have to look at our future dreams and what ministries we can um, have a head extend on or expand on and maybe new ministries we can we can start depending on what our finances look like um, and we want to make sure we are good stewards of what God has given us in our time our talent and our treasure right um, so over the past couple of uh, week and now week two uh, we've been talking about that last week we talked about our priorities right the priorities um, in which uh, we hold stuff, and how most times our pri or sometimes our priorities um, can be different than maybe what God intended. The money tends to be one of those that is at our top priorities, but it's not always what we um, do for intended purposes. And then sometimes also our our gifts, which is the other thing we're called to give up, like right our talents. Sometimes our talents, it's like, well, I kind of want to use my talent to lift myself up rather than God, which sounds innocent enough, but that's not the only reason we are given the gifts that we are given, is it? Today we're going to talk uh, um, and dive into 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to talk a little bit about what, what we're calling mine and ours, which really should be mine is not mine, it's God's. Uh, and yours. What what are we, we we called to give of ourselves? What are we supposed to call to keep for ourselves? And what are we called to uh, give back to God of all of our stuff? So, um, open your Bibles. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Second Corinthians chapter nine, verses six through fifteen. And today we're going to be discussing that um, and how we are called to serve and whose will we are serving, our own or God's. So, um, we'll be. Reading that, I don't think, honestly, I don't think we're going to get to the Proverbs one. So that's going to be part of your homework is to read the Proverbs one at home that's in your thing. So take that with you. Let's read six. What I mean is this. The one who sows a small number of seeds will also reap a small crop. And the one who sows a generous amount of seeds will also reap a generous crop. Everyone should give whatever they decide in their heart. They shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure. God loves a cheerful giver. God has the power to provide you with more than enough energy, or sorry, more, more than enough of every kind of grace. That way, you will have everything you need, always and in everything to provide more than enough for every kind of good work. As it is written, he scattered everywhere. He gave to the needy. His, righteous, uh, his righteousness remains forever. The one who supplies seed for planting and bread for eating will supply a multiple year, uh, multi multiply your seed and will increase your crop, which is righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every way. Such generosity produces Thanksgiving to God through us. Your ministry of this service to God's people isn't only fully meeting their needs, but it is also multiplying in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. They will give honor to God for your obedience to your confession of your of Christ's gospel. This will do sorry, they will do this because this service provides evidence of your obedience and because 
of your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. They will also pray for you, and they will care deeply for you because of the outstanding grace that God has given to you. Thank God for the gift that words can't describe. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's easy for me to read today, apparently. Having one of those days. All right. Um, so we're going to break this down into two parts. That's a lot of scripture, right? I don't like just giving a whole bunch of scripture and saying, remember all that. As I talk through, the, so we'll break it down in a couple different pieces because it's easy to, uh, easier for us to understand. Um, the first part can be broken into a little bit of an old cliche, right? Um, we've all heard the saying, you reap what you sow, right? Um, maybe not as literally as the scripture is talking about. That may not be what the saying is, but it means the same thing, okay? A farmer doesn't expect to go to a harvest, uh, to go and harvest ground that isn't his, right? You're not just going to go and say, ah, my corn crop wasn't good enough this year. I'm just going to take the combine over to the neighbors. I'm going to borrow some. I don't, I've never been a farmer, but it doesn't work that way, does it? Oh, okay. I just want to make sure. If it does, oh, man, that's rough. <laughs> I'd rather be the neighbor that doesn't have a good year. Um, no, but um, maybe, the, maybe you do go over there from time to time because one of the things I did experience up in um, uh, Epworth uh, as I did, I, I didn't grow up around farmers, but I learned a lot from the ones up there, is if somebody, a farmer's having a rough time, all of a sudden, like, five combines that aren't his show up on his property to help him get his stuff done. Man, what we could learn from that, right? What if the whole world was that way? But you go, and you don't go expecting them to give you something, right? Oh, man, he's down on his luck. I'm going to go do it for him, and then he's going to give me half of it. Uh, again, doing it for maybe the wrong reason, right? Um, but it, it, there's all sorts of instances where you can look at that and, and question, are we doing stuff for the right reasons? But um, the farmer doesn't expect that. So then why, let me ask you this, we, we think that's common sense, right? Everybody agree that's common sense, that you're not going to expect more than what you did, especially as a farm, when it comes to a farm. I have no responses. Are we going? Are we okay? Are we on the same page? Let's wake up today, okay? I get it. Iowa State fans are tired from celebrating, and Iowa fans are in mourning. We'll be okay. <laughs> okay, so then why as a church do we expect God's will to be done in our church when we think the church is supposed to serve us and not the other way around. Hmm. We expect that more is going to come to this. I literally talked to a couple the other day, um, and just the other day, and they said they were considering leaving the church. They're not from here. They, they said they were considering leaving their church because the church was no longer playing the kind of music they like. Okay? So they were, we laugh, we have people chuckle. That is too dang common. It is so common. And, and we think automatically because of worship wars, we, our brain automatically goes to, well, that means somebody's leaving because they're playing contemporary instead of hymns, or they're playing hymns instead of contemporary. I've been at churches people have left because we don't play the right hymns. Like, seriously. But they, they, they genuinely asked me this question, Pastor, is it okay to leave the church because they don't play music we like? And as a pastor, most, or some I know would be like, yeah, come to mine. I said, absolutely not. You can't leave. What? But we don't like that. When did church become about you? The music is literally, if, if Robin is playing music for anything other than God, she needs to quit. If Eduardo's going out and playing his guitar for anything 
other than God, you need to quit. If you're playing it for them, stop. If you're playing it for them, stop. It's not about them. It's about God. And if you don't like it, suck it up. Sorry. Better learn to play yourself and play your own music at home. Too real? It's the truth. Okay? That's not a reason to leave. Now, that doesn't mean there's not a reason to, to leave a church. And I told him that. I said, the only reason you really have to lead at a church is if the church is no longer teaching biblical truth. Then you can leave. 100% get out. 100%. Makes sense. Okay? I, I understand if that's going on. Or, or if maybe, maybe if your vision and the church's vision don't coincide. That makes sense? Because every church has different goals, right? Every church has different ambitions. Sometimes that may not line up. Sometimes it doesn't work. But is there a good way to leave and a right way to leave? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It frustrates me, and this, this got me heated the other day, not with them, but in general, because... This isn't a new thing because people want it to be about them. What if God is calling whatever is wrong with the church? It's different in the church that you don't agree with in the church or the music that you don't like. What if God putting that on your heart is him telling you, well, you do something about it. If you come up to me and tell me, well, I don't like this in the church. If you put it this way, this is your fair warning because it happens from time to time. It doesn't matter if it's music or something else. If you come up and tell me you don't like the way something's being done, be prepared to do it yourself. Y'all going to stop probably coming and talking to me about that now? Because <laughs> I guarantee you ain't nobody ready to say, I don't like the way this is doing it. You want the job? Well, no. Oh, suck it up. <laughs> It changes the attitude, right? It changes the mindset. But if God is putting it on your heart, maybe that's God starting to push you towards that. One of the biggest problems in the Christian church today is people want to just come and feel better about themselves when they walk through the door. And there's going to be those messages. There are. Because at the end of the day, yes, we're going to be called out for our sin. Yes, we're going to have stuff that sometimes challenges us. And I've told you a hundred times over, and I won't ever stop saying it. If I don't ever make you squirm in your seat, fire me. Because we better feel convicted at times because there ain't nobody in this room. No matter what you think is perfect. Those of you that are married, you don't believe me, ask your spouse. <laughs> okay? None of us are perfect, so there should be stuff that's always convicting us. And I told you the things I struggle with more than anything are the things I'm most passionate about because I'm talking to myself sometimes. None of us are perfect. We're broken. This is a place for the lost, the hurting, and the broken. And if we aren't focused on that and we're so focused on ourselves and what we want, We'll never actually fulfill God's purpose for our church, ever. We talk often about that. Um, and it's a struggle because we still all struggle to sometimes be like, well, I don't like this. Or I didn't like the, 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 this, the message today because it, it wasn't for me not going to bat a hundred or a thousand. Sorry. It's just not. Okay. Sometimes we need to really start asking ourselves when we struggle with something, when we don't like something, are we complaining about preference or purpose? Because if we're not doing it for the right reason, then the power of God, or if we're doing it for anything other than for God to reveal his power in people, 
to, to reveal his goodness, to reveal his grace, then we ain't doing it or we're not considering it for the right reasons because our only focus should be God and how to make it holy and pleasing to him. Amen. That's it. No matter what time the service is, no matter the style of music, no matter the amazing food, no matter whatever it may be, it's not about you. It's about how do we glorify God better. We need to focus on, on letting our inward concerns die and start looking outwardly. How do we expect to harvest more than the same amount we put into the fields every year? How do we expect children's church to grow if more people don't step up and say, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this amazing thing. How do we expect to fulfill our mission and vision if people don't know their percentage of the, what they're giving? How do we expect that to happen if we, if we don't actually take ownership of it and say, I want to invest in the vision. I want to invest in the mission. I want to do this for God, then how do we know we're ever going, what we're ever going to be capable of? How do we know where we're ever going to grow? If we're not willing to try new things that maybe don't make us the most comfortable. Maybe if, if oh, I come up with this new idea and, and somebody comes up and says, hey, I want to do this amazing project. I want to do this thing. I want, God has been putting this on my heart for us as a church to do this because people do come up with some great ideas a, a lot of times like uh, uh, the kids against hunger thing last year was absolutely amazing I'm excited to do it again but you know what the difference between that and some of the other ideas we've had she didn't come up to me and say hey pastor Mike here's my idea now you go do it if God's putting it on your heart who do you think he wants to do it? I don't have those skills. I don't have that ability. Good. Because when you try and use your own skills, when you try and do it by yourself, it's usually not as good as if you just let the Holy Spirit work through you. Period. You don't... Some of my biggest flops for me as a sermon are when I say, you know what, God, I want it to be about this because this is the focus I think we need to do. And I'm like, I, I got this one. And then afterward, I'm like, man, that bombed. Oh, yeah, because it was me. And I'm not a good public speaker. Really not. Ask my high school teacher. Ask my college teacher. It wasn't good. Don't ask me to ever give a speech on how to bake cookies or, or ever ask me how to bake or to bake cookies. Don't ask me that, Lana. It'd be bad. Okay. <laughs> if we don't know what we're giving, if we don't know or we're not listening to what God is calling us to do and telling us our special ta uh, uh, talent is, and some people tell me, I don't have a special gift, or I don't have this, or I don't have that. It's absolute baloney, and you have a purpose, because if you didn't still have a purpose, or God didn't still have a purpose for you on this life, in this life, you'd be on the other side of the dirt. God's not done with you until you go home. Period. As long as you have breath in your lungs, God has a purpose for you. You have a gift. You have a way to help grow the kingdom. You have a story to share or a gift to give. You have your time. You have your talent. You have your treasures. But how are you going to live it out? When you're, and how are people ever going to believe us and call ourselves Christians when what we say with our mouths doesn't match up what we do with our hearts, right? Because if we're sitting here giving lip service and then we're not doing the things we're telling others to, we're not actually going out and using our time, our talent, our treasure to change the world, why should they listen to you? Second half of this verse is, is often misused and misinterpreted, and it's frustrating. 
um, makes us a little eerie to talk about, including me, uh, all, most pastors, including myself. Um, but not because I think Paul isn't, isn't making a good case um, and, and trying to get, but I believe that Paul is, is writing to this church in Corinth, and even us today, that if we don't serve, uh, that we don't serve a God of scarcity. We don't serve a God of very little. We skir- serve a God of abundance. We read a, a few weeks ago, um, um, or last week, that, that during the Great Depression, the church had higher giving than it does today. Is that because we have less now? Is it, is it because, or is it because of stuff like trucks being $70,000 instead of fifty? <laughs> or is it is it because our priorities have changed? Or is it because we've started to reserve stuff? Or maybe it's because people then had a stronger faith. He's sending us, Paul said, uh, uh, sending us this message of whatever we do, we do for his kingdom to spread the word. And if we remember that, he will use it and he will bless us. Not that if we give, we're going to become rich, which is what it gets used as. Okay? I'm like, well, how is that possible? How is this, how is me coming in and uh, uh, serving in children's church going to make a difference? How is me giving and knowing that I give X percentage matter? How does uh, 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 me using my small gift that I don't think is that big a deal to serve the church. How does any of that matter? It doesn't matter without the Holy Spirit. But if you trust in God and trust in the Holy Spirit, it's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same God who used Moses, who was a stutterer, and the Israelites, who were screw-ups, to escape one of the most powerful armies in human history by splitting the Red Sea. Right? And helped him escape this. It's the same God who we're talking about in our, our, our uh, Bible study right now that s- made the sun stand in the sky, so, uh, stand still in the sky, so Joshua could accomplish the goal that God sent out for him. Okay? It's the same God who fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. Is the same Holy Spirit that is willing to work inside of you. If you let it. God sent. It's the same God that sent his son to die. For the sin. That we deserve to pay for. And he's telling you. He's wanting to bless your ministry. But we need to think bigger than we ever have. And we need to. Quit limiting ourselves. To what God says is possible. It probably wasn't Moses' preference to have to step out and do what he did, right? He's probably scared. You think Joshua wanted to go and have to do all the things he was told to do? No, but God used them to glorify his kingdom and to make happen what he needed to and they just said okay I'll do it and we reap what we sow and I think that that time is coming where we're going to see God do things we never imagined and here's why as children we are taught that we can do anything right we're taught that everything's possible We all probably had some crazy dreams of what we were going to be. But at some point, somebody or something told us we couldn't. And we believed it. At some point, some of our dreams came crashing down or we thought we had to lessen them because they were too big. Because that's what the world tells us. But through God, all things are possible. Everything, even healing this hurting break nation, this hurting and broken nation in this world. 
We need to quit praying for stuff that is tiny and start remembering the God we serve. I've seen the impossible multiple times, and I've told you guys these stories. One of the guys is out there, a small little man, Stan Wearson, okay? Started a camp of a couple kids going all over the state. And I think they, he said his first year they didn't even break 100. We now do just one week of up to four out of 500 kids. Don't tell me something's not impossible. I've seen a church that was dying have a youth program lifted up, and it carried the church through. And now that church went from worshiping 60 and having 90 in their youth program to worshiping 300 because of the youth. I've seen church plants go and, and people said this isn't going to work and now they're some of the biggest uh, uh, because it's in an area. The book we're reading, Charlotte is a place to go for plant churches to die and he went and planted a church there because it's what God called him to do and now it's one of the biggest churches in the country. I've seen people that people said would never give their life to Christ walk away from drugs, sex, every bad thing that you can imagine and give their life to Christ and become amazing disciples. But we have to trust what God can do. No matter what our, we think our limitations are, God is bigger than that. We just need to have the realization that as a church, let's start to have God-sized dreams. And we need to start realizing we serve a God of abundance, not a God of scarcity. Amen?